Hello everyone, I'm Marbat al Asnad here in Madrid for ESC Congress 2025. And with me is Khaled al Hi. Hello. Ready for another round, Khaled? Yes, absolutely. Well, this morning we had a few hotlines that were presented at uh, ESC Congress. The first was the double choice. Yeah, this, this was an interesting one. It actually randomized just over 800 patients to two strategies. It compared uh, conventional uh, uh, conscious sedation with local anesthesia to a minimalistic approach using only local anesthesia. And then it uh, randomized again to either the uh, NeoAccurate 2 platform versus the Evolute Pro Pro Plus and FX. So that, uh, as far as the anesthesia arm of the randomization was concerned, the primary endpoint was uh, a composite of death, vascular or bleeding complications, infections requiring antibiotics or adverse neurological outcomes at 30 days. And in fact, there was no difference between a minimalistic approach that only used local anesthesia compared to the more conventional local anesthesia plus uh, conscious sedation. Although they do admit the patients with the local anesthesia they were a little bit more uncomfortable and had more stress levels, but really no difference as far as the outcome uh, was uh, concerned. And the conclusion that a minimalistic approach is safe and feasible uh, in this uh, subset of patients. The other thing is they did compare, like I said, the new Acura 2, which unfortunately is no longer on the market, to two the uh, Evolute Pro Pro Plus and FX platforms. And surprisingly, it was non-inferior, admittedly at 30 days, with significantly lower pacemaker rates and paravalvular leaks. So uh, maybe it's information that could be used in uh, the uh, design of future platforms, but unfortunately, the new Acura is no longer with us. Certainly disappointing that it's off the market now. Um, another trial that was interesting was the Digit Heart Failure Trial. Now, just when we as a medical community have decided to write off digoxin from our patients, this kind of reintroduces the concept of using digitalis in advanced heart failure patient. This was a very robust trial. It was randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, and it was um, dr outcome-driven. What they did is they took patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction who are NYHA class 2 to 4, and an ejection fraction of less than 40% and randomize them to digitalis versus with guideline-directed medical therapy or on top of guideline-directed medical therapy and compared it with placebo on top of guideline-directed medical therapy. And the outcomes that they were looking for were death from any cause and then hospitalization for worsening heart failure. They enrolled about 1,200 patients with about 600 in each arm. And interestingly, the absolute risk reduction was 4.6% with an NNT of 22 for this trial. So there was a significant reduction in death and heart failure rehospitalizations in these subset of patients um, who are on optimal medical therapy. Now, in addition to that, what we do learn is that it, it was consistent across all subgroups and the treatment actually proved to be safe, which was one of the main concerns about using digoxin in the original DIG trial um, because of its narrow therapeutic window. Albeit now, it's important for us to really define what optimal guideline-directed medical therapy and whether they're on all uh, uh, guideline-directed pillars. I think it, this included optimal medical therapy plus device therapy, if indicated. Absolutely, absolutely. But today, more than these hotlines, what was very interesting in the highlights of day one of ESC Congress was actually the guidelines and the release of multiple guidelines. Hala, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, well, in fact, there were uh, three new guidelines, uh, one updated guideline and one consensus statement. I think that we'll start off with the value of the guidelines since they probably are most relevant of interest to our audience. And a general theme for the guidelines was the, again, the emphasis on the heart team and the patient-centered approach. In fact, patient, two patients were involved in the task force that wrote up the guidelines to get the patient's perspective and input on it. Again, they emphasized the importance of the uh, expert valve center and clearly uh, showed in the guidelines that uh, outcomes are very closely related to center volume and operator volume. So this is something important that complex cases should be referred to expert valve centers. Uh, another thing that was generally uh, emphasized in the valve guidelines, irrespective of the valve you're talking about, was the role of multimodality imaging, uh, not just the traditional echo and transesophageal echo, which we are accustomed to using, but really 
uh, placed now multi-slice CT and cardiac MRI uh, with uh, as key components of the patient evaluation when uh, as, uh, assessing uh, valvular heart disease and making uh, decisions. Uh, also included in the guidelines on valvular heart disease was a section on special populations, which include mixed valvular heart disease, sex-specific considerations, and patients who present with valvular heart disease and shock or cancer. Uh, one other item that I found interesting being a TAVI operator was that we no longer need to perform coronary angiography prior to TAVI. If you have the information you need from the uh, multi-slice CT performed for TAVI, uh, you can omit coronary angiography. Uh, what did you pick up on this well, I think Session. this last point that you made is long overdue. CT scan has been robust in evaluating coronary artery disease, and it's about time the guidelines reflected it. But what I found interesting was that the guidelines changed for asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis. And this is actually following the debate we had this morning with the um, principal investigator of the early TAVR, uh, Philippe Genero. But effectively, it's a class 2A indication now per guidelines to proceed with replacement in asymptomatic patients with severe AS if they have any of the following. So A, they have high gradient aortic stenosis with severe valve calcification detected by cardiac CT, maximum progression of the peak gradient of more than 0.3 meters per second per year, an elevated pro-BMP or BMP that is attributable to aortic stenosis, an ejection fraction of less than 55% that, again, is attributed to aortic stenosis itself, and an exercise treadmill test that sustain, with a sustained fall in blood pressure of more than 20 millimeters mercury. Do they need all of them or just one or more of those? One or more of these. More of but in addition to them having low risk, low procedural risk, and it's a shared decision by the heart team. So once again, re-emphasizes the role of the heart team in contemporary decision-making for patients with TABR. That's interesting. Another thing is that actually our current hospital guidelines for TAVR have made it to the national European guidelines because at our hospital, as you know, Merfet, for many years now, uh, patients above the age of 70 are directed without necessarily a formal heart team meeting to TAVR, while those under the age of 70 uh, with low risk are sort of automatically referred to surgery without necessarily having a heart team. And these are now the gui the ESC guidelines. So age is important. Age above 70 is generally an indication for TAVR. Below 70 is an indication for surgery. Uh, all other things being equal. Yes, exactly. All other things being equal. Also, uh, new in the guidelines was the they addressed bicuspid aortic valve. And here they, again, they gave uh, patients who had favorable anatomy uh, for a bicuspid aortic valve for TAVR a class 2 indication if these patients were not good surgical candidates. Another interesting point in the updated guidelines is that for severe uh, aortic insufficiency who are ineligible for surgical aortic valve transplant uh, replacement, again, after heart team discussion and a suitable anatomy, that TAVR now is uh, on the horizon. And another thing that's perhaps uh, practice changing is the guidelines now afford a class three recommendation for dual antiplatelet therapy yeah. for t uh, following TAVR. So that will certainly change quite a few practices. That's going to change my practice starting next week. It's, yeah. Well, what about the other valves, mitral yeah. valid? Well, when they talked about the one, I think the part that really grabbed my attention was now we have a very clear definition and they make a a very important point in defining atrial uh, secondary MR from ventricular secondary MR. And that, uh, that I think, is something that uh, we're going to hear a lot more about and now it's clearly defined in the guidelines of which is which and which therapy is most appropriate. So for the definition of uh, atrial MR, you'd have to have a ventricular ejection fraction of greater than 50% with no regional wall motion uh, abnormalities and minimal or no left ventricular dilatation, um, a dilated annulus in the dilated left atrium with normal leaflet uh, motion and morphology. And for atrial secondary MR, a surgical repair gets a 2A uh, indication uh, for those who are ineligible for MTR, who uh, gets a 2B indication while MT gets a class 1 indication for uh, symptomatic ventricular uh, MR.
And, you know, just to wrap up these guidelines, they did address the tricuspid valve as well, and particularly when intervening for other valvular uh, heart diseases, again, they really addressed when to go ahead with surgical or transcatheter uh, valve replacement in these patients. But also interesting is that now it's a class one recommendation with moderate aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation in these patients with mixed valvular heart disease, because that is the new challenge in managing. There's a whole section on mixed valvular heart disease. It's going to be very interesting. How about myopericarditis? That was one of the new guidelines, fresh. Yeah. And the myopericarditis, or what they, they now, now have coined a new term for it, which is inflammatory myopericardial uh, syndrome. Uh, this was a brand new guideline. It's never been uh, uh, featured in the SC guidelines before. And they based it around sort of 10 commandments or 10 key messages. Uh, the most inf important, I think the highlights that I took from it was the fact that it's looked as one spectrum of disease with similar etiologies. Uh, and they coined the term, as I said, inflammatory myopericardial syndrome that encompasses both infectious and non-infectious etiology. Also in the guidelines here, it stressed the, the role uh, of CMR, cardiac uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, in diagnosing these patients. Uh, and really, in most of these patients now, you can make the diagnosis comfortably and initiate treatment without thinking about the need for an endocardial myocardial biopsy, except in uh, high-risk patients or in those in which uh, there is suspicion for a secondary underlying cause that would warrant specific treatment, such as sarcoid myocarditis, eosinophilic or giant cell myocarditis. Also, the role of genetics uh, was emphasized in genetic screening, especially in those who have recurrent myopericarditis syndromes. And then tailing treatment, depending on patient presentation. So these patients present in different ways. Some will present with an arrhythmia, others with heart failure, and others with a chest pain syndrome. So again, uh, stressing how to approach these patients depending on their, their uh, underlying presentation. Yes. Now, in terms of managing hyperlipidemia, these are not new guidelines. These are updated guidelines. But I do think there's a lot of new evidence um, that has crept up over the last couple of years, which really does warrant the update that they have. The most important to me is that they added uh, a section on extreme risk patients, extreme risk individuals. And it's a 2B indication now to target an LDL less than 40 in those in whom we define as extreme risk. For ACS, again, they also discuss acute coronary syndrome patients with hyperlipidemia, and it's a class one indication now um, to uh, maximize the dose of statin. And combination with azitamibe is now a 2A indication per guidelines. One of the novelties on the guidelines is LPA and measuring LPA at least once in a lifetime of uh, uh, adults. But the important thing here is that they actually use the 50 milligram per deciliter as a cutoff uh, very specific in the guidelines and should be considered in all patients as a risk-enhancing factor with a high LPA level associated with a greater or an increase in risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So I think there's quite a lot to dissect there in the dyslipidemia guidelines, and perhaps it will enlighten where newer uh, data is lacking. For one last thing I'd like to mention before you close off, if you almost forgot it, well, and this is, I think, this is why they mentioned it. There was a consensus document on mental health. And it's a very frequently overlooked, as we nearly did ourselves just now, but mental health and cardiovascular disease interplay. Uh, patients with mental health are at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, and cardiovascular disease can impact the well-being of patients with mental health problems. Uh, and it really, it was more a, a call to action than anything else, emphasizing this relationship and how, how further research is warranted uh, in this space. Absolutely. Well, thank you for bringing it up, and thank the audience for watching day one. Let's see what day two brings. Stay tuned tomorrow.